What is ultramontanism? Is there a false spirit of Vatican I? All this and more on the One Peter Five podcast with Peter Kwasniewski. Jesus is King. Welcome to the One Peter Five podcast, restoring Christendom, rebuilding Catholic culture and tradition. I'm Timothy Flanders, editor in chief of One Peter Five, and I'm joined by our one of our contributing editors, Peter Kwasniewski. Doctor K. How are you doing today? Doing very well. Thank you, Timothy. It's always good to talk. Yes, always always a pleasure. Glad we could have this conversation. Uh, we're talking about Dr. K's new book, which we'll discuss in a moment. This is going to be part one of two or three podcasts. We're focusing on this issue more and more in 1 Peter 5, as it is, our view, one of the critical issues, which helps to unlock a lot of problems that are going on. So we're going to get into that in just a minute. Uh, before we do, just want to encourage everybody to please like and subscribe to this video. Please help us rebuild our donor base at One Peter Five. We are a nonprofit. We rely on your donations to help us. So in particular, we need monthly donors. So if you can just $5 a month, $10 a month, anything you can spare to help us, that would be most appreciated. We do provide One Peter Five free for all but it is not free to produce. So please go to onepeter5.com slash donate to become a financial partner. So let's look at, uh, let's see, this is your, let me pull up the promo photo here. This is your new text. Your newest text is the road from hyper papalism to Catholicism, two volumes. Uh, do you want to, just give the viewers an introduction as to the volume one and volume two and what this investigates. Sure. Sure. I, I'll just give a simple sketch. Um, I split it into two volumes because it was really just too much for, for one uh, volume. And also mainly because the focus of each volume is sufficiently distinct. They can be read by themselves in either order um, or even just by themselves. And uh, volume one is a more theological and spiritual focus on what is the office of the papacy in the church, um, what is its role, what are its limits, and what should our response be, what should, what should our attitude be if we happen to be living by divine providence, by God's inscrutable decree, in an age when we have a bad pope, either a morally bad pope or a doctrinally unsound pope, uh, or both, as seems to be the case at present, wrapped up in one. Um, and then volume two is a deep dive into Pope Francis's pontificate, the first nine years, um, from practically from, from day one uh, until, you know, the, the end of the ninth year. I have, I was, I've been writing articles, just observing what's happening. Um, and so I, I, I arranged these chronologically. And to me, it was very, <clears throat> it was very telling that, you know, as I went through chronologically, I mean, I gave him the benefit of the doubt for quite a while. I, I tried as hard as I could to understand what he was doing, where he was coming from. The first few chapters in volume two are, you know, in, in a certain sense, in retrospect, you might say trying to make lemonade out of lemons, but I was doing what I could. And after a certain while, that just broke down. I couldn't do it anymore. It was not possible uh, to give him the benefit of the doubt. Um, that that juncture, you know, happened at different points for different people. Um, you know, red pills uh, come in all, you know, sizes and shapes and schedules. But um, in any case, volume two then would be where I deal with things like uh, the death penalty, Amoris Laetitia, uh, Pachamama, uh, you know, and, and various other issues that, you know, have been flashpoints in this pontificate. Excellent. Yes. Yeah, so there's a hardcover version. I have the soft cover cover version myself. Uh, but both you can you can buy both as one or separately. So the uh, our friends over at Aruka Press put this out, and that link is below. So you can purchase volume one and two together, or volume one or volume two. And I think that that's that's exactly what um, Dan Millette said about volume two was that he was it was interesting to go through chronologically with Pope Francis and how. You were initially trying to work this out. And I think that's that's really the, the story of many Catholics, as you said. Um, but first, before we get deeper and deeper into this, I want to go through some of these basic objections because I'm still seeing comments online where people are saying, wow, 1 Peter 5 or Kwasniewski is promoting Eastern Orthodox ecclesiology or 
He's, you know, we're, we're trying to undermine Vatican I and the dogmas thereof. So why don't we just start with this? Um, would you say, I mean, are you promoting Eastern Orthodoxy? Are you promoting <laughs> undermining dog? Are you an old Catholic? <laughs> no. Who are you? No, no, of course not. Yeah. No, I mean, you know, one, one thing that's disappointing about online discourse in general is just how incredibly superficial and, uh, and, and um, flippant uh, or, or, you know, immediately reactive it is. People people look at a headline and they instantly make a reaction to it. They don't take the time to think. This is a big problem in our time. That's part of the reason why I wrote these books. I think, I really am convinced, just a general point, if people want to understand something in a deep way, they need to to get off of social media and read a good book on the subject and really think about it and get into it and chew on it and pray about it and not just expect you know a tweet to solve all their problems or whatever or or expect a short a short article or a paragraph to to expose a person's whole view about about a certain matter you know that's impossible um, especially when we're dealing with with more subtle issues um, but no basically I mean my 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 general desire as a Catholic, as a believing, fervently practicing Catholic, traditional Catholic, uh, is, you know, that the church is founded, in a sense, on the papacy. Um, it's founded definitively on Jesus Christ. He's the head of the church now and forever and unto ages of ages. Amen. Um, but the, the Pope is the vicar of Christ, the one who on earth stands in for him, um, in, in a sense, and and uh, it has special authority within the church. My entire project, as it were, is to ask, what is that papal authority? What is it for? Can we can we look into the sources of Catholic tradition and can we see both from those sources and also just from observing how popes and councils have acted uh, and what catechisms have taught and so on? Um, can we see you know, what is this, this uh, primacy of the Pope, his, his jurisdictional primacy, um, his, his, um, his doctrinal primacy? What is it consistent? Does it have limits? Uh, and, and what are the, the conditions, so to speak, under which it's supposed to operate? Um, for example, all authority is for the common good. Um, so the Pope's authority also must be for the common good. Well, what does that mean? Can we flesh that out? So with something like Vatican I, I just want to, to ask, what is the council definitively teaching? What is it binding us to? Can we read this carefully? Can we ask, what does it mean in light of the whole tradition of Catholicism? It, no text interprets itself. You can't just you know, isolate a couple of paragraphs from Pastor Eternus and think that that's going to give you a whole ecclesiology. It doesn't. It can't possibly do that. And no sane person would ever say that it does, right? Yeah. Um, in, in, ter in terms of Vatican I, um, there are things, obviously, that it dogmatizes, which we as Catholics assent to with full divine Catholic faith. Uh, there are things that it just says in passing. There are also things that in the Gasser's Relatio, which are ambiguous. It says, for example, that the Sea of Rome cannot become a sea of pestilence. Well, what does that mean exactly? That's not a theological definition. Um it also says that the Pope has the charism of, of truth and unfailing faith. Well, what does that mean exactly? They, the, the council did not delve into all of these different historical examples of sort of inconsistencies, as it were, with certain aspects of the papal office because the council did not choose to, to, to dogmatize those things. Yes. Um, so we know certain dogma, dogmatic things. We assent to those. And then from there, there are disputed points as to can a Pope become a heretic? Can he not become a heretic? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Does the Pope enjoy infallibility in other cases beyond ex cathedra, or does he not? Mm -hmm. Is there a protection that goes beyond ex cathedra? If so, what is it? What is its nature? These are all disputed points of Vatican I that have not really been resolved at all. There might be majority or minority opinions thereof. Mm -hmm. But these are this is the space where the false spirit of Vatican I arises, where the the entire daily life of the Catholic revolves around the person of the Pope and his latest statement. That would be yes. the, this false spirit. Um, and that's what I, and that's what I call hyper papalism. I mean, we'll, we'll get into that as we talk about ultramontanism, but I tried to find a term that was really clear uh, in, you know, what, what I'm, what I'm, what I'm talking about is an exaggeration or a hypertrophic excess, uh, you know, an overgrowth 
um, of the of a member in the body that leads to a kind of monstrous result. Yeah, I have a, on page five of volume one, you you define hypertrophic ultramontanism as quote a sort of excessive adherence to the person and policies of the Pope by which one simplistically takes everything he says as a definitive judgment and everything he does as a praiseworthy example, wrapping the mantle of infallibility around all his teachings and the garment of impeccability around all his behavior. Mm. He's sort of canonized while he's, as soon as you ascend to the papal throne, he's a saint. He's, yeah. he's Well, that seems to be the tendency nowadays. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I would just add something else uh, in connection with what you're asking about. And that is, you know, the theological tradition of the church, you know, is, it's 2000 years old. It's very rich. It's diverse. There are a lot of different voices in the tradition. And there are many open ended questions. There are many disputed questions. And I don't mean this in the sense in which, you know, recently a Vatican talking head from the Pontifical Academy of Life was trying to propose that the, the that the um, prohibition on contraception was a questio disputata. No, no, yeah, no right. that's not. That's absurd. That's an absurdity. But, but what I'm saying is there are questions that are open to discussion and theologians, uh, for example, to what extent the Pope can err, um, can, the, can a Pope be deposed, if not um, by someone lower than himself, can he self-depose himself, uh, can God depose him under certain, or would God depose him under certain circumstances. Um, you know, these are in fact debatable questions. And if you look at you know, you look at sources back in the Middle Ages, some of the canonists and you look at John of St. Thomas, uh, Cajetan, um, you know, Suarez. I mean, all of these theologians have very interesting things to say about these questions, most of which has been forgotten. And although there are there tend to be some majority positions within the scholastic tradition um, and particularly within the neo scholastic tradition of more recent centuries, those two, even the majority opinions, are still opinions and they're still open to discussion, especially if there are what you might call surprising counter indications, right, given in, in church history. I think that the 20th and 21st centuries force us to reconsider certain points that might have had a kind of consensus prior to this time. Uh, I think one of those, for example, would be the infallibility of canonizations. I know we can't get into that today. <clears throat> though it's related. <clears throat> but, you know, people look at the canonization question and they say, oh, you know, nearly everybody agrees that canonizations are infallible. And it's, you know, it's temerarious to question that. But then when you drill into it, you start to realize, actually, the church has never definitively taught on this matter. Uh, and even the consensus of the theologians is open to critical questioning. And there are some darn good objections that can be raised against the infallibility of canonizations, which is why I published, I edited a book on the subject, which has both pro and con uh, articles in it. So I, I'm in favor of real substantive theological discussion and debate about matters that are not cut and dried, that are not closed off. Yeah, and this is something that... Um we're trying to get into 1 Peter 5 and the fact that as Catholics, we need to understand that there are levels of theological certainty and levels of binding propositions. As we said, there are the binding propositions of Vatican one, which we all adhere to, but there are these lower things that are less certain. They are disputed. They are actually disputed questions. They haven't been settled. And this, this, I wanted to comment on Eastern Orthodox so-called ecclesiology because really there is no such thing as Eastern Orthodox ecclesiology. There are various viewpoints in the Eastern Orthodox world. It just coming from my own perspective, I worshiped in the Eastern Orthodox church for four years. I converted to Rome and I, I spent a lot of time. I was studying at the graduate level, these questions of East and West and whatnot. And there are basically just these different opinions among the East. There are different theologians in the East who have varying opinions as to what constitutes an ecumenical council, what is the center of unity in the Eastern Orthodox world, different aspects of it. There's Eucharistic ecclesiology. There's a form of universal ecclesiology. There's the Moscow patriarch versus the Constantinople. There's all sorts of different opinions. Mm -hmm. Now, the problem is that at Vatican I, there were Eastern Catholics at Vatican I, Eastern Catholic bishops who objected to the definitions of Vatican I based on different different criteria. Like there was the inopportunist who said, we shouldn't define this. I believe that it's true, but we shouldn't define it because it's going to lead to a misunderstanding or something. 
Um, but the problem is that there are some Eastern Catholics who are saying something that's good, but it does end up overlapping with some of the things that some Eastern Orthodox say. So it's easy to confuse those two because obviously the Eastern Orthodox get things right. We're, we're you know, they are truly our separated brethren. Yes. You know, they, they, I mean, their biggest, their biggest uh, critique is something that, something that trads, I think, also often have, which is the integrity of the local bishop and his authority must be kept intact and, and the, the papal office should not undermine it. Yes. That's, you know, yes. that's something that we would, we would agree with, of course. Yeah. Um, so that's, yeah, I, think, I, think I, think. I think that Pope Francis uh, has, 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 de has demonstrated more than any, possibly any other Pope in history, um, a, a, a real tendency to absolutize the papacy in the realm of discipline, in the realm of the relationships with bishops. I mean, we know this, the, all of the talk about decentralization and synodality is a smokescreen. I mean, it could be partly true in the sense that, that there might be a desire to create a certain amount of anarchy and chaos by, by shipping out various decisions, even doctrinal ones to Episcopal conferences or whatever. So that would be fully consistent with, with a, a modernist could, could fully consistently both want to decentralize and, and, and synodify certain decisions, but also want to absolutize other decisions in order to promote the same progressive or modernist agenda. I mean, it would, it would actually be quite clever to, to play both sides of that, um, you know, in a sort of Hagan Leo fashion. Um, I, I, I like you, Pope Francis should have called himself Pope Hagan Leo. Uh, but anyway, we, we can, we yes. can, uh, yeah. uh, here's, here's a good, uh, question here. Uh, where does it say that the consensus of theologians is open to question? Uh, to that, I would say, so just, just so everyone understands that the consensus of theologians typically means, that phrase typically means the scholastics as defined by roughly 1100 to roughly 1800, all those theologians, scholastics, they all have a consensus on X, Y, Z. That is generally held to be something that's, that can be binding in, in a, on a very high degree. Mm -hmm. To that, I would say, on the one hand, one could say, one could dispute whether or not there is a consensus. There could be an apparent consensus, but then there is something that arises, which which re makes us realize that it's not really consensus. Or there could something that could arise that that was never even contemplated by this consensus, mm -hmm. where now we have a new situation that's entirely different that changes the, the some of the parameters of the question mm -hmm. so that the consensus could be true. But then in another instance with another parameter, it, could, it might be different. So mm -hmm. those are my thoughts. What do you think? Yeah, no, I mean, I, I, I think that it's, 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 it, when, when you, when you study the scholastics, you realize that they have a lot of agreement on, as, as when you get to broader levels, as you sort of recede from the details, you can see more and more agreement. But when you get into the details, there's often subtle differences among them, which in, in questions such as the extent of papal uh, disciplinary power, for example, you know, could be very interesting to explore. And are, I mean, I have certainly seen examples of, of scholastics who have said quite suggestive things about the limits of what a pope can do with regard to the church's venerable rights or sacramental rights. Um, I mean, just to throw this out there, since, since I, I'm the one who brought it up, I mean, the Council of Trent, uh, the, the, the Tridentine Profession of Faith, um, binds Catholics not just to sacraments, you know, in some kind of reductive, neo-scholastic reductive way, like, uh, you know, form and matter of sacraments. It, it binds Catholics to received and approved ceremonies, right? I mean, that's, that's a very suggestive phrase. And you can find that the, those kinds of discussions in the scholastics. So I think we need to be careful not to oversimplify what their consensus is nor to elide or ignore the the subtle variations you can find among the scholastics. Um, but mainly I would also just re-echo what you were saying. Um, you know, there are, in church history, there are first times when problems come up, okay? Um, if, if a theologian in the year 200 or the year 300 had sat down to write a comprehensive theory of ecclesiology or church government, we would look at it now as a kind of valuable but quaint exercise. And we would say, oh, that's good as far as it goes, but there's a lot more that you need to say because of what happened in all the subsequent centuries, right? So every century brings with it new curveballs that have to be dealt with in ecclesiology, right? That's what it means to be living in 
history, living in the contingent, in the particular, in the mess that is fallen human history. Okay, so I don't care. You know, if a, a theologian of 1500 may have a lot of great things to say about the limits of the papacy, but after, during, and after Vatican II, and with what we're seeing now, we need to rethink some of these questions. Not to reject what the scholastics have said by no means, but to amplify and augment and nuance what they've said and recognize that, you know, okay, well, <laughs> if this account that you're giving doesn't work, that doesn't mean it's all wrong. It just means you didn't see every aspect of the question that could be seen. You didn't make every distinction that could be made. That's how, that's how theological progress happens. Yeah, absolutely. Um, an example of that is the Western schism where there are three popes. And so people were wrestling to try to figure out how this would work. And it led to somewhat of an error, obviously with conciliarism, mm -hmm. but then there was a, a corresponding rejection of that error, which brought out a greater truth because it, it made the, the papacy as, as, as a foundation of unity shine forth great with greater light. Mm -hmm. um, but let, let's just trace real quick, just sort of briefly, as you do in the first few pages of your of your volume one, the growth of the papal office and the birth sort of this of ultramontanism, mm -hmm. um, it certainly seems to be very much a post Tridentine, uh, um, a post Tridentine movement which continues to coalesce. Uh, what are your brief reflections on some of the history of how this came about? Yeah, I will. Gosh, that's a huge question. You know, uh, that's like a 600 page tome yes. you know, by Eric Ibarra, uh, you know, that to answer that question. But anyway, um, no. So, I mean, clearly in the history of the church, the Bishop of Rome has at certain strategic moments exercised an enormous uh, impact on on particular theological discussions. You know, the Tome of Leo at the Council of Chalcedon. I mean, you can you can come up with examples like that. And medieval popes like Innocent III were very much aware of their universal authority. Um, and their, their, and so it's not a question of, it's not really a, it's not to say that the Pope has a unique office in Christendom and that he has a kind of authority over everyone uh, in Christendom, in the Catholic Church is nothing new. Um, it's something, you know, many great historical studies have been shown uh, including just to take, I mean, Joseph Ratzinger, right? He's not a traditionalist author, uh, but but he, you know, his book called to Communion gives a very, you know, knockdown argument for the primacy of Peter among the apostles and the primacy of the Pope even in the early church. Um, I mean, he's, that's just one book among many that makes this case. So there's no question about about a succession, about a primacy, um, about a, 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 a kind of supreme authority. Um, it seems to me that the, the problem arises rather when other principles that are equally valid in Catholic theology and in the Catholic religion are forgotten or neglected or downplayed, such as that all of the bishops are successors of the apostles and that they share in the governance of the church together. They're not just, they're not just vicars of the Pope. They're not just branch managers of Vatican Inc. Okay, uh, and that's certainly the way Pope Francis treats bishops. Um, uh, and so, what what does it mean to say all of the bishops form the college of the successors of the apostles? And you think whatever criticism people might have of Vatican II of Lumen Gentium, it was trying to say something important about a reality. Uh, and I really like Bishop Schneider. Bishop Schneider also frequently comes back to this idea of the apostolic college and the responsibility of all the bishops for the church. That's why Bishop Schneider says he speaks out as much as he does, because he says, I'm not just a, a, a petty little bishop of a little fiefdom somewhere, and I have nothing to do with the rest of the church. I'm one of the apostles, so to speak. And, you know, I'm in, I, I have a responsibility. Uh, the whole church weighs on my shoulders in a, in, in a certain way. Um, but also the principle of tradition itself, right, which is, which is obviously a, a profound topic in its own right. But tradition is normative for the church, for the Catholic Church. Um, popes themselves are bound to receive and to uphold and to pass on Catholic tradition. Um, now, it's not self-evident what Catholic tradition is. 
especially when you get into the details. What 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 there are different kinds of tradition. There's dominical tradition. There's apostolic tradition. Uh, you know, there's ecclesiastical tradition. I mean, you can make these distinctions. You have to make these distinctions. But the sum total of tradition and traditions is something that the church has always had a positive evaluation of. Th this has been seen as good, as God-given, as part of the exercise of divine providence, as something the Holy Spirit gives to the church, and as normative. And if you look at just how popes have behaved, even the worst popes of history have not dared to, to completely overthrow and redesign traditions that they've received from the past. But there's that was unthinkable. That was inconceivable. They could have said, I am the Pope. I'm the Vicar of Christ. I have supreme authority over the whole church, but I'm not going to change the mass. I'm not going to change the, 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 the received and approved ceremonies of the church. No, that's unthinkable. I would never do that. Right. So that's what I mean by saying there are other principles at work besides just the supremacy of the Pope. Yeah, it does seem that the I, I well, what you just said reminded me of. Um... The anathema from Nicaea 2, which is whoever rejects an ecclesiastical tradition, written or unwritten, let him be anathema. Mm. And an ecclesiastical tradition is really a, a small t tradition. It's yes. on the smaller end, like an icon in particular, like this particular icon may or may not be, you know, something like the, written by St. Luke or whatever. But um, they were dealing with people destroying images as people destroyed statues and whatnot in our churches in the 20th century. And I thought of another example where um, I can't remember if it was it was uh, I was Clement who which Clement was it I, I can't recall but when they when they prom oh Clement the eighth 1604 so when they promulgated the the Clementine Vulgate mm -hmm. which was after Trent which was meant to be a more accurate Jerome Bible there were some discrepancies between that Bible and the Roman Mass so yeah. in the the Sanctus there was um, uh, the Lord of Sabaoth versus the Lord Exertium. And uh, a bunch of people started me changing the mass to go with this officially propagated Vulgate. And Clement VIII condemned them. He said, we're not, we're not going to change the mass, even if we think the, 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 little, the literal text of the mass might be actually inaccurate from what the Bible actually said, because we propagated two different things. So it's, it's a very interesting thing how the, the even Pope VIII, Clement VIII keeps both of these traditions. And he does. He refuses to suppress either. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, exactly, but, exactly. Yeah, go ahead. Yes. And I mean, you. And I mean, since we're talking about some liturgical examples, uh, you know, there was one pope who approved. He did not mandate it, but he approved the Quinones breviary, which yes. is a profound rupture with the history of the divine office. And another pope subsequent to him. Um, you know, revoked that permission and in fact condemned it uh, as an innovation, um, you know, and similarly, we could bring up the example of Urban VIII and his hymns, the botched classicizing, paganizing uh, modifications that that Urban VIII made to the great hymns. About a thousand hymns of the Roman breviary were affected by Urban VIII's revisions. And th th those were those revisions were criticized. Uh, there, there have been many criticisms over the over the centuries of those hymn revisions, although all, these sorts of criticisms are always quiet and sort of, you know, on the margins because people don't want to speak against the Pope. Uh, but but in fact, people can see that the revisions damaged the the artistic integrity of the poems. Uh, they 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 brought in you know imagery of of you know Zeus you know and his thunderbolts you know instead of instead of keeping yeah, to yeah. the more Christian Latin of the early church and the medieval church, and you know what it's it's ironic but but already you know when 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 the when the uh, Novus Ordo uh, liturgy of the hours was promulgated by Paul the sixth, the hymn texts uh, in many cases were were repaired and restored to what they had been before Urban the Eighth, which is a very long, uh, after a very long duration, yeah. uh, the church is quietly saying, you know what, what Urban the Eighth did was a mistake. We need to restore the hymn texts. Now, tragically and sadly, by that point, almost nobody was using Latin hymn texts anymore, you know, and, and like the American uh, Liturgy of the Hours it didn't even use the hymns at all. They, they just, they just put it like, you know, Scarborough Fair type thing. <laughs> They, they just they put in other things uh, instead of the hymns altogether. But so it was, it was too little, too late. But I'm, I'm just saying, I think, you know, 
this this idea that popes cannot make um, howlers uh, in the in the realm of of liturgy is really untenable. Yes, absolutely, um, and that's interesting. I didn't know that particular piece as to that was when it was versed. That's interesting. Um, now, um, I wanted to touch on a few notes of historical significance, and then talk about the term ultramontanism, and then get to your more of your personal journey, Dr. K. Um, because it does seem that the post tridentine period, which was very militant in a good way against the Protestants, the Counter-Reformation, the Jesuits in particular, leading the charge very much. Uh, and that Protestants really, the Protestants went after the Pope in particular. They called him the Antichrist. Um, and so Catholics defended the papacy um, and the opposite of the Antichrist. But there was a valorization very much of the papacy <laughs> against the Protestant heretics. Um for good reason, but then after, in particular, I think of um, Ulrich Lehner in his book, The Catholic Enlightenment, he says that one of the biggest exuding of papal enthusiasm happened around Europe after Napoleon took mm -hmm. over most of Europe, but Pius VII resisted him, and Pius VII returned to Rome a hero to mm -hmm. most of Europe because mm -hmm. he was he had resisted Napoleon, who was this tyrant, or, you know, all of Europe had had turned against Napoleon, Pius VII had, 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 had fought him and won, basically. Um, so Pius VII becomes a hero to all of Europe. You mention Gregory XVI, actually, when he condemns the Lamine, he does so without theological censures, which is sort of the creation of the faithful <laughs> cyclical. That yes. was very interesting. And we, especially under um, Leo XIII, we have just churning out encyclicals. And this is really an innovation of the papal office because the papal office has never been a universal teaching office that just yes. turns out encyclicals. That's never yes. been the case before. Yeah, no, I mean, this is a really important point to recognize historically. And Alan Finister, by the way, does a great job talking about this in various places. Yeah, um, he is. Uh, namely that, that, you know, it was very, it was a natural, it was a natural um, move, especially in 19th century Europe to think, you know, the church is under attack from all sides, from Freemasons, anti-clerical, anti-Catholic, revolutionary forces, right? We need to band together. We need to have one obvious leader. Um, you know, we, we, need to, we need to, in a sense, put the Pope on a pedestal and everybody has to follow exactly what he's doing so we can be one army of serried ranks, you know? Uh, and, and if, I mean, that made a certain amount of sense sociologically at the time. That's, that's why people wanted to look over the mountains to Rome, you know, ultra Montanas. Um, and I mean, it seemed like the only way to hold the church together in that revolutionary disarray. Um, but the, 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 the effect of that in a sense was to the, the Pope, I suppose you could imagine a Pope who, whom everybody admired and everybody followed, but who was still very uh, reserved and very discreet and only published documents when necessary and still condemned errors, you know, with censures. And you could, I suppose you could imagine a sort of an earlier type of Pope, even in modern times, but that's not what happened. What happened is the Pope then became everybody's parish priest, you know, in a sense, he became everybody's Bishop. He started doing the work that the local bishops were supposed to be doing. He started doing, you know, he was, he was basically issuing pastoral letters of the sort that bishops used to issue for their own dioceses. And that's what an encyclical letter is. Now, if, if, if a pope did that occasionally, it probably wouldn't have much make much of a difference. But if you have a kind of churning out, almost like a factory of documents from the pope and from the Roman Curia, which is what we've seen for the past 150 years or so, but especially the past mm, 100 years, um, and maybe even more in the past 50 years, uh, then, you know, it, it can encourage a great deal of laziness among uh, the the bishops and pastors. You know, they're just sort of like, as I said before, they're like the branch managers, the lower level management, um, and they can just receive their, you know, all their instructions from above. Um, this is a very strange, uh, and, it's, and modern media, there was a great article the other day by Derek Taylor, I believe is the name of the author at Crisis Magazine, um, where he talks about uh, about how the it's the it's the modern media the newspapers initially and now of course and then later television and especially now the internet that make it possible for the pope to in a sense have a 24/7 presence in everyone's life 
um, you know, and, you know, through all these different means of communication. Uh, that, that's, that's a very top heavy model. It puts all the eggs in one basket. It, it requires an almost mythological and superstitious um, uh, exaggeration of one office in the church, which, you know, historically speaking, is more of an office for it's like the Pope is where the buck stops when nobody else can deal with the problem. You know, the bishops have tried to deal with it. You know, it's subsidiarity, right? On the lower levels, the teaching and the ruling and the sanctifying is buzzing along as it's supposed to. And then and then, oh, no, you know, there's a huge problem that arises. Jansenism arises. You know, we have to now look at, at uh, the work of Cornelius Jansen, and we have to decide whether this is orthodox or not. That gets bumped up to the Vatican. The Vatican analyzes it and then condemns very precisely erroneous statements, right? I mean, that's, it, it, it worked beautifully. That's, that is the way that, that things are supposed to work. Yeah, we have in the modern period a, a ma such a massive bureaucracy, uh, mm -hmm. I mean, the question is, did Vatican I enveloptize the bureaucracy as well as the head? Because there's all these bureaucrats and all these people who have to feed information to the Pope. And there's no possible way he could even do this unless he has this army of bureaucrats doing all these different things as well. Well, and you so, know, and, and, yeah. and just to mention, there's there's a there's a there's a wonderful author named Bronwyn McShay who um, wrote this classic article at First Things years ago called Bishops Unbound. Um, and I, I can't recommend it highly enough. It's one of those articles. It's like on my top 10 list. I recommend it, you know, whenever I'm saying you want, if you want to understand church history, you have to read this. Uh, so Bronwyn McShay talks about how after Napoleon, and thanks to the example of the Napoleonic Code, the church began to model itself, the church on earth. Um, so I won't say the church herself as in the Immaculate Bride of Christ, but churchmen uh, on earth began to model church structures after the the modern post-revolutionary state um, with its huge bureaucracy, almost like, you know, the, the, the prototype of the welfare state. Um, and then the code of canon law is like a Napoleonic code of law. The church had operated prior to the 1917 code with a, a, a kind of organic plethora of legal sources that had to be consulted, which is the, still the way it is in the Eastern Orthodox Church, right? Because they have no centralizing force that could give them a 1917 code of canon law or a 1983 code of canon law. Um, and what, what Bronwyn McShay shows quite convincingly is that is that starting in the 19th century and culminating in the 20th century, the centralization of authority in the papacy and in the bishops of the Catholic Church and the removal of real substantive, mm, I don't want to say authority so much, but but responsibility, co-responsibility for the faith and for the church from the laity uh, is, is an unprecedented change in history. Prior to modern, these recent centuries, the, the responsibility for the church and the faith was distributed widely throughout Christian society. Kings, queens, princes, uh, um, you know, bishops themselves, of course, uh, in their own way, who were often princes too, in a secular sense, um, and then and ar aristocrats, guilds, right? All all of these were kind of like centers of gravity that had a real say and a real influence on what happened in the church, and they could even serve as a kind of set of organic checks and balances, right? Not like the artificial checks and balances of the American Enlightenment government, you know, executive, legislative, judicial, whatever, which works well enough in its own way. But but like more like checks and balances of different centers of authority that had to work together. In fact, they had to work together if they were going to get anything done, you know. Um, and so you, you have, I mean, a great example of this, just to give a concrete example, is John the 22nd, right? When he taught the false teaching about the souls of the just, you know, not going into the beatific vision, but having to remain in this kind of cryogenic state until the end of time. Um, when he when he taught that error, he was opposed by a number of theologians. Those theologians were not afraid to say to the Pope, you're wrong, sorry. Uh, but he was opposed by the King of France at the time. And apparently the King of France threatened him. Uh, I, and, and, you know, I said, you need to change this or or else there's going to be trouble. Right. Um, and, uh, you know, and of course, you know, there's the example with with the, um, the, the pope in the in the Saclum Obscurum uh, of the pornocracy who was uh, 
ousted by one of the emperors, right? Otto. Yeah, uh, Otto the first. Mm -hmm. Otto the first, right? So, um, you know, again, I'm not necessarily putting these forward as models like, oh, this is, you know, we need to have an emperor come in and kick out Pope Francis. I'm not saying that we don't have an emperor anymore who could do that even if we wanted it to happen. But it's more like Bronwyn's point about this, this holistic, organic um, society, Christian society of co-responsibility for the faith, um, such that it was not possible for any one member of the church, no matter how great he was, to call all of the shots and to treat everybody else in the church as like raw material that could be mastered, like Cartesian, Baconian mastery of nature, right? This is just, this was impossible. Um, so that's... Yeah, I, I think this is bringing up a, 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 a very important aspect of this, and that is basically a clericalist idea of the church. When you say the yeah. church today, often you just meet the clerics, which is, it's never been the case that that's, the, the church has always been the spiritual and temporal sword, uh, the kings and princes, along with the popes and bishops. But what's interesting is that there was actually what's called the Ninth Crusade, which is where there's a bunch of volunteers from across the world to defend the papacy, the papal states against the Masonic revolutionaries who were unjustly seizing the papal territory. And so the Pope actually really was, I mean, he, he is still the, to this day, a monarch, a temporal monarch, and they were fighting for him. And in this revolutionary, counter-revolutionary battle, uh, he did really become this, the monarch leading the, the army, bo army, both temporally and spiritually. Uh, and so ultramontanism as a term, uh, let's talk about that a little bit, because the, our very first comment actually here, uh, Ultramontanism is Catholicism. Uh, and so I, I this is something that's brought been brought up by uh, Jose Ureta, uh, Roberto de Mate, certainly allies of the trad movement have, have called called uh, critical stances about our questioning of ultramontanism. And it, it does appear that ultramontanism can it really can take different senses here. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah, um, of course, of so. Course. What are your thoughts on on the term ultramontanism, uh, its limits and its definition? What do you think? Right. I mean, when you're dealing with with terminology and 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 uh, you know, his, when you're dealing with terminology applied to historical movements and and tendencies, there's always the possibility for misunderstanding. Um, you know, for one person taking a label to mean one thing, another person taking it to mean another. Um, I mean, I, I sort of pity somebody who simply equates Catholicism with ultramontanism. That seems like an extremely reductive view of what the Catholic faith is. But, but be that as it may, um, you know, I think that Roberto de Mattei and Jose Ureta are just simply pointing out that that uh, ultramontanism, ultramontanism can be given a perfectly legitimate meaning, a meaning that doesn't have any excess built into it, right? If if what it means is Catholics should look to the Holy Father. To, to endorse and support and encourage uh, the traditional Catholic faith, traditional Catholic faith and morals. Um, they're entrusted to him. He has an obligation by divine law to, to faithfully administer the deposit that he's been given, right? And we should look to him for that guidance. We should expect it of him. We should demand it of him, right? Um, so I, I'm not in favor of diminishing what the Pope can do and should do. Um, I'm I'm in favor of 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 holding him to his actual responsibilities as we can know them by divine revelation and by the traditions of the, by the tradition of the church. So it, it, that's why I think De, De Matei and Oreta have have told have told me, don't use ultramontanism in, in, in a pejorative sense, right? If you want to speak of an excess, um, a kind of extreme ultramontanism, then you should give it a, a special label like hyperpapalism, which it seems, you know, I, that's why I said before, I think that's a better label for the for this phenomenon. Yeah, it seems to me that the we can, in general, we could distinguish two different senses of it. We could say that this is a historical term to describe a historical movement. And that's the way you take it in in your very uh, page one, yeah, uh, where you just quote the Encyclopedia Britannica. Uh, mm -hmm. Ultramontanism in Roman Catholicism is a strong emphasis on papal authority and on centralization of the church in the most general historical terms possible. And that would just really encompass really every single centralizing papal idea of the 19th century and 20th century mm -hmm. without excluding anything. 
Yeah. You could take it in this totally historical sense. So it's really everything. That's whether, whether that's your right. orthodox ultramontane or you're a hyper papalist. It's all really one exactly. big. Exactly. And and that is isn't that the problem that it's this gigantic turn? It's it's a huge um, big tent, as people like to say, you know. And and a lot of things can gather underneath that tent. Uh, from you know, I mean, you could you could call someone like John Henry Newman. Uh, I mean, if you have a broad enough definition, you're going to end up calling somebody like John Henry Newman an ultramontanist, even though he he was very worried about uh, the oppor oppor the opportuneness of the Vatican One definition, and he was worried that popes would be encouraged to abuse or to misuse um, a, you know authority that, that that had been praised to the skies, uh, that they'd be tempted to use it um, in the wrong situations or even in the wrong direction. Um, but there's no question that Newman supported the papacy. I mean, you can you can quote reams and reams of Newman where he where he's supporting the the authority of the Pope. So this is not about really not about the Pope or the papacy as such. It's about a way of looking at it and and a whole set of attitudes and behaviors that go along with it, right? Yes. Uh, it's it's really about whether the Pope is so powerful that he can destroy the church of which he's the head. Right. It reminds me of that 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 funny paradox, you know, uh, you know, uh, is is God is God so all powerful that he can make a rock that he can't lift? Well, it's it's a silly question. I mean, that's 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 an absurdity because a material thing has to be only a given size and whatever size it is, God can do whatever he wants with it. So it's a silly question. But in a way, you could ask, you know, is the pope so powerful that he can transmogrify Catholicism? He can turn it upside down, inside out. He can modernize it to oblivion, past recognition. He can burn every possible bridge to evangelization. He can do he can do everything wrong, but because he's the Pope, we have to we have to swallow it. We have to accept it. Uh uh, that's not Catholic. That's not even Christian. That's not even rational. Here we go. <laughs> Just a quick note here. Um, Benedictus says one final clarification: both of you are not rejecting the usage of papal encyclicals, are you? I no, we're not rejecting the papal encyclicals, but something can be a good thing in and of itself, but it, it can sometimes have indirect consequences, which may yeah. not be even intended or foreseen by anybody. Right. So we're just let me, let me give an example yeah, of that. An example of the problem is the following: almost everybody nowadays, when they talk about uh, the church's teaching on contraception, they say they talk about the ban on contraception. As if it's just something that the church arbitrarily decides to do. like, we're going to have a ban on, you know, the sale of semi-automatic weapons and we're going to have a ban on contraception or whatever. Okay, no, no, no. It's not a ban. The, the church has always taught that deliberately impeding the transmission of life uh, in marriage is sinful. It's, it's, it's contrary to the primary end of marriage. Um, and that's the universal ordinary magisterium, which is infallible. That is something that has been known long before Paul, Paul VI and Humanae Vitae. And the only reason that there was a question at all at Vatican II, you know, in, in 1965, when, when uh, I think it was Gaudium et Spes that punted the question to a papal commission. And then in 1967, the majority on the commission said that the Pope should approve the pill. And then in 1968, to almost everybody's surprise, Paul VI said, no, no exceptions, right? Paul VI wasn't banning something. He was just reaffirming the perennial teaching of the church, right? Um, which you could see in Pius XII's address to midwives in 1951 and in Casti Canubii of 1930 and backward, back and back and back, okay? So the problem, with the, the problem with the encyclical is not with an encyclical per se, but that, you know, it, it tends to to cause people to forget the universal ordinary magisterium uh, of the centuries and to focus on the will and the thoughts of the reigning Pope right now. And so the conservatives, they hope and pray they'll get a conservative Pope because he's going to give them the encyclicals that they want or they're looking for or they're hoping for, you know, which would be presumably in continuity with the past. And the liberals and the progressives are cheering for a Pope of rupture because he's going to give them encyclicals that say what they want. Right. So then it, it all becomes politicized and doctrine starts to become like a football that's, you know, passed this way and that that's so unhealthy. It's so destabilizing for the church. Um, some of you might, might be familiar with this series. This series is called Tradivox. Um, 
And I, I just made a post at Rarate Cheli today about the latest three volumes, six, seven, and eight. But one of them is a brand new hardcover edition of the Catechism of the Council of Trent. Um, it's, a it's a beautiful edition, and it's only 30 bucks, which makes it much more affordable than the Baronius Press one. Uh, and it's just as nice uh, or nicer. Um, but I, I mentioned Tradivox because their, their whole vision is to publish in 20 volumes um, classic Catholic catechisms, representative catechisms that span a period of 800 years, okay? And they all teach in unison. They all teach in unison. This is a, a witness of the universal ordinary magisterium. Um, it's not the magisterium because they're catechisms, but it's a witness to it. Uh, and on something like the death penalty, every one of these dozens of catechisms for 800 years says exactly the same thing. I mean, it says it in interestingly different formulations, but it's always the same teaching at the end of the day, right? That's what immediately blows out of the water anything that Pope Francis wants to, to do that's contrary to that kind of unanimous witness of Catholic tradition. Right. So we, we've we spent a lot of time trying to clarify things before we actually get into your journey. Oh, sorry. From to, no, no, this is this is very important. We got, somebody's bringing up set of in the chat again. So there's so many different things that I, I think this this is really witness to the fact that we are under this false spirit of Vatican I. So as soon as somebody starts to talk about this, even in the way you mentioned, I just read it in your book, even in the mention, like you, you quoted some medieval who was talking about a heretical pope. If you start talking that way nowadays, people are like, oh, you're a sede. Well, that's exactly what they, they talked about in the medieval right. ages. Yeah, it's All a these Catholics of, talked about that. So you know. let, let me ask you this, though, Dr. Gay. So can you tell us more about your personal journey as a Catholic growing up, uh, John Paul II, Benedict, your journey from ultramontanism? <laughs> as as understood as hyperpapalism, that's what we're talking about, to Catholicism. Tell us more about your journey, your story there. Yeah, sure. Um, it's it's interesting. So when, when I when I was a teenager, um, I was I was I grew up in a Catholic family, you know, cradle Catholic, um, went to church. You know, it, it was actually it was a really awful liberal parish. Um, I like to say it was covered with carpet and Eucharistic ministers. Um, but anyway, uh, so, I mean, I didn't really know my left hand from my right hand as far as, you know, but I, I just went to church and in high school, um, I discovered, I, I, I went to, I started going to a charismatic, um, youth group that was run by very conservative people. They were very John Paul II Catholics. Uh, and this would have been in the, um, well, gosh, I mean, this was like right around the, the, the late eighties we're talking about. So they were very John Paul II Catholics, very gung ho about, um, you know, they were natural family planning teachers and they were into theology of the body stuff. And they were, you know, it was all and I didn't really have any equipment for understanding. But but what I what was given to me very clearly was if you want to be a serious Catholic, then you got to just be with John Paul II. That's that's almost like they're equivalent to each other. To be a Catholic is to be with John Paul II. Um, and as I studied a little bit more and, and kind of rediscovered and fell in love with my faith uh, in a way that I had never done before um, through that group and also through through lots of books that people were giving to me when I started searching, um, it just seemed to me in the late 80s and, and into the 90s, um, early 90s, mid 90s, that the only way to hold the church together in the post-conciliar chaos was to follow what the Pope says. And, and follow it in a sense blindly, whether you understand it or not, you've got to follow it. Um, and, you know, after all obedience, right? I mean, there's no other choice, even, even to think that there might be a time when you could disagree with the Pope makes you just as bad as Hans Kung or Charles Curran or all these other, you know, horrible liberals uh, out there. Um, you know, and, and I guess built into that was sort of the idea. And I think that was very much a part of the cultus or the, um, the popularity of John Paul II almost as like a rock star a bit uh, is, is, you know, that the popes will always be good guys, you know, fighting the baddies, right? Um, they're always going to be wise, prudent, holy, and well-intentioned. Uh, so this, you know, the, the papacy on a pedestal that I was talking about earlier, which was very much encouraged, uh, I, I think, 
you know, almost in a weird sort of way. Like when you look at some of the photos of Pius XII, like standing with his arms outstretched, being carried on the Sadia Gestatoria, the sort of messianic, you know, it's it, it gets a bit strange psychologically, to be honest. Um, but I guess there's that that idea that, you know, this the cultist there is of a, a man who cannot possibly fail. Um, he can never let you down. He's never going to do anything wrong, right? And this is an impossible, I mean, this is impossible to sustain. So what what happened then to me is when I got to college, and especially after college and gra graduate school, um, some cracks began to appear in that edifice, right? Why did they appear? Because I began to study church history. I began to study theology in a deeper way. Um, and I began to see some deep inconsistencies between, and even contradictions, um, not only between pre-conciliar and post-conciliar popes and councils uh, and, and, and documents, uh, but but even within John Paul II's own magisterium, I was beginning to see tensions. You know, like like where he seemed to be speaking out of both sides of his mouth, uh, you know, affirming and and denying uh, in in different ways. Um, and and I saw the same thing later on with Benedict the Sixteenth. You know, uh, almost giving taking with one hand what he gave with the other. You know. Um, and so, you know, looking into something like Assisi and the Assisi gatherings, that was very shocking to me. It, it really shook me up. Um, and reading John Paul II's justification for Assisi, that shook me up the most because, I mean, I don't know if you've, if you've read that recently, but um, it, it's, a, it's a wild piece. Uh, it, and it's definitely um, uh, questionable. I'll, I'll just use that polite term. Um, and, uh, you know, and then, you know, something later on, something like John, John Kerwin's book, I mean, this is jumping ahead uh, to more recent times, but John Kerwin's book, which is unfortunately very expensive, but if you're serious about these questions, you need to read this. It's called An Avant-Garde Theological Generation, The Nouvelle Theologie and the French Crisis of Modernity by John Kerwin, uh, published by Oxford University Press. Why do I point to this book? because he documents painstakingly that under the influence of the Nouvelle Theologie theologians in France primarily, but they had their, their connections everywhere in Europe uh, and in America, there were changes, really important changes in the notions of revelation, salvation, and mission, okay? Uh, such that if you, when you see these words, you can't assume that they mean the same thing as they did before, right? Um, and sometimes they can mean something different enough to be, I would say, even in tension with and and quite possibly contradictory to what they meant before. Um, you know, so I, anyway, that was one set of things I learned, learning about the complexities of church history. So learning about bad men on the throne of Peter, that was something that nobody had ever talked about. Um, it was always just John Paul II, John Paul II all day long, like he was the only phenomenon that had anything to do with the papacy. Um, and when you when I pulled back from that nearsightedness and I started looking at the different centuries, I learned about Honorius and Vigilius and uh, and Liberius um, and John the 22nd. I, I learned about, um, you know, the pornocracy, the saculum obscurum. You know, I, I, I learned about the Renaissance corruption of the papacy that led to the, the and, 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 and the general chaos of the 15th century that that occasioned uh, though it didn't necessarily cause the the Protestant revolt, right? Um, and then I learned about the resistance that was given to various popes at various points. Uh, Roberto de Mattei's book, um, you know, that's called Love for the Papacy and Filial Resistance to the Pope in the History of the Church. That's a fairly recent book, but it's a kind of summation of what I'm talking about here. All the different examples of where people stood up and said, with all due respect, your holiness, that's not right. What, what you just taught is not right. What you just ordered or commanded or prohibited is not right. Um, and we're not talking here about ex cathedra statements. And we're not talking about anathemas or censures. We're just talking about other kinds of teaching and governing actions, right? Um, yeah, so I think, I, I guess I'll just mention one other thing. I, I mentioned Bronwyn McShay already, and that's very important, so I won't talk about it anymore. But John Lamont, reading John Lamont's treatment of Jesuit obedience and the, the way in which the notion of obedience was corrupted, uh, or at very least, maybe that's too tendentious a way of putting it, but, but um, you know, 
the the notion of obedience was was transformed in the hands of the Jesuits into something more like the blind obedience and the pure passivity that we see, you know, that we often see nowadays among papal apologists. Um, and John Lamont, I think, does a wonderful job uh, explaining how that's that's not the the Catholic tradition prior to. The, the Jesuits for thinking about obedience. And that, of course, then prompted me to write my own little book on, on, the, on the question as well. So these are just a whole bunch of different things that come to mind um, that, that never, it never shook my faith in the papacy at all, because I see too clearly that that's part of the Catholic Church. I, I can't shake that off. I could never become Eastern Orthodox. But it, it definitely put cracks in the edifice of the ultramontanism or the or the hyper papalism. Yeah, the um, that's interesting. You brought up the Jesuits. Is that uh, where is the Lamont comments on the Jesuits? Where is that written? So he has a he has a couple of pieces online. Um, I think one of them is called something like the sexual abuse crisis, uh, uh, a Jesuit tragedy. I think I, it's something along. Oh, okay, the, it's on Rorate Celi, and then there are there are some slightly longer versions of that at, um, I think at the blog of the Society of St. Hugh of Cluny. Um, okay. Yeah. Well, th that's, that's very interesting because it does seem to be a monastic or Jesuit obedience that is, is being asked of, of many Catholics. Um, now, why is this not a set of a contest argument? Uh, can you tell us about why is set of a contestum not a solution? Yeah, I think I think that what's what's going on with the state of contests is they are taking a particular historical moment, a configuration, a self understanding of the papacy, or an or an ecclesiastical set of opinions and assumptions that are born in ultramontanism of the nineteenth century, and become exaggerated even by popes teaching non authoritatively. Um, and so they, they develop this exalted, I would say, almost Homeric or heroic or epic notion of what a pope is or what a pope is supposed to, to do and to be. Um, and then they look around and they can't see that kind of pope. They can't see him in all the popes going back to John the 23rd. So it's like, oh, is Francis that kind of pope? You know, always teaches the truth always commands, you know, what is in accord with the common good of the church? No, he's definitely not that. Is Benedict XVI? No. Is John Paul II? No. John Paul I, well, he didn't really have enough time to prove himself. Um, you know, Paul VI, oh, definitely not Paul VI. You know, so so then you're, you're just left with this bizarre, utopian, idealistic, abstract church, a church of one's own platonic perfection, where, um, where you know, you have no popes, you probably don't have any bishops or not many of them at any rate, just a handful uh, and clergy. You have hardly any sacraments available anywhere else on the, on the, on the earth. And the reason for this catastrophe is that you're holding on to a hyper papalistic conception that isn't part of the Catholic tradition, isn't verified in history uh, and should be discarded, right? We Catholics ought to deal with the mess of history. We ought to be able to accept messy situations and, th and apply our theological analysis to the messy situation, not, not in a sense, um, uh, 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 rejecting the messy situation. Oh, this is so messy that the real church must no longer, must no longer be here. And the real church is to be found in some other idealistic place where there is a Pope who is just like Pius XII. Well, look, let's, let's beat the Sedes at their own game, okay? How traditional does a Pope have to be in order for you to accept him as a pope, and therefore blindly obey everything he says every, and 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 do every uh, everything he commands, right? How how traditional does he have to be? Well, Pius the Twelfth, I'm sorry, but Pius the Twelfth wrecked the venerable rites of Holy Week. You know, he lent his his support to ideas and personalities of the liturgical movement that were to have devastating consequences, like like the Assisi Conference of 1956. Um, he introduced a dangerous precedent by shifting discussion from dogma and doctrine to opinions in humani generis. I can't go into that more right now, but that's the kind of thing that, that 
that someone like Kerwin would go into. Um, he inverted the Lex Arandi and the Lex Credendi in Mediatra Day, which is otherwise a, a fantastic document, but it's got it's got a wrinkle in it that is that is going to give people like Bunini all the ticket that they need, right? So Pius XII was a great pope in many ways, but he was not this um, this uh, perfectly Catholic heroic figure that you could never raise any questions about, you know. Um, and Pius XI, right? He threw the Mexican Cristeros under the bus, sacrificing them to their cowardly bishops. He condemned Action Francaise, which was a major force of renewal in the French church at the time. Uh, Benedict XV, he quietly abandoned the anti-modernist campaign of his predecessor. Pius X, okay, another amazing pope and a saintly pope. I have no problems with Pius X as far as his saint, saint, sanctity is concerned. But he wrecked the he, he wrecked the immemorial cursus psalmorum, the, the, the course of the psalms of the Latin divine office. And he gave he gave expression to a diseased hyperpapalism that that has that that has had, I think, terrible consequences subsequent to him. Um, and I'll just stop one more example. Leo the Thirteenth, right? He, you know, what an amazing pope. I love Leo the Thirteenth. I produced a volume of uh, on Catholic social teaching that heavily incorporates his encyclicals. You know, I know Leo XIII very, very well, um, you know, as, as a teacher of the faith and as a defender of the faith. Um, but, you know, he threw his weight behind the highly dubious Ralliement in France. You know, he, he told, he essentially told the Catholics to hand their country to the Freemasons and the anti-clericals. I mean, he wasn't thinking of it that way, but the French Catholics on the ground knew that that would be the effect of the Ralliement. And it failed, as could have been predicted, and as was predicted at the time. And Pius X completely scuttled Leo XIII's Ralliement in that sense. This is something Roberto de Mattei is, is very good on as a historian. So, so what I, the point I'm making is how traditional, how good does a pope have to be for the state of a contest to accept him as really the pope, right? It's it's a it's a total it's a it's a it's a morass of subjectivism, right? They, they have their own sliding scale about when a pope deviates so much that he can no longer be seen as the pope. And what I would say is, if a pope is not using his ex cathedra authority to define error, and if he's not um, binding Catholics to do something which is mortally sinful and deadly for their faith, then he can he can do any amount of other damage, but he's not doing he's not undermining the dogma as such directly, frontally, uh, definitively, and he's not commanding sin, right? Um, now I, I realize that there are many questions that pop up from this, but that's that's my view. I have a minimalist view of of what Vatican One Pastor Turner demands that we hold about the Pope, uh, and. I, I think that this is this is a form of realism, not a form of idealism. Yeah, absolutely. I think that that's the the reality uh, is that there have been these papal missteps. Uh, I and I also think of, of Pius the Ninth when he called Vatican One and refused to include laymen, which was a total innovation. Ecumenical councils were basically invented by a layman, uh, Emperor Constantine. You know, so uh, it was the the French Minister of State said that Pius IX has promulgated the separation of church and state by this move. So mm -hmm. it's, it's a very difficult era. I mean, and even these saint, saintly popes can make some some mistakes, some missteps, different things, different errors in judgment. Right. Uh, so, so let me just add one note then. Go ahead. It is, you know, then somebody could say, well, doesn't that undermine your confidence in the church? Um does it undermine the indefectibility of the church if you can have popes that make mistakes on important matters? And especially if you have popes, as seems to be the case, you know, as we get later on in time, who are, you know, who are catastrophic, not, not just making like one little, one strategic mistake here or there, which is probably just almost impossible for any human being to avoid, um, regardless of, of what, what, uh, what office he holds. Um, no, it doesn't under, undermine my confidence in the church or her ineffectability. And the reason is that it's precisely in times like this that we see the census fidei, the sense of faith that belongs to all the faithful, um, activated 
right? It's alive. It's active. God never abandons his people, um, even if he permits a wicked shepherd, right? There's, there's never going to be a time when a wicked shepherd arises and every single Catholic in the whole world is completely dazzled and blinded by him and falls in love with him and obeys everything he does to perdition. That's not going to happen. And that's certainly not happened in the pontificate of Pope Francis. He's been the most controversial pope we've, we've possibly ever had. And of course, as I said before, the media you know, plays a role in that because we can we can more easily point to things that have gone wrong and and errors that he's made or or that he's spoken, but the census fidei fidelium is alive and active. That is God working in the church, and that is also a way in which the church's indefectibility um, is is demonstrated. Right, that in baptism the faith is entrusted to all of us, not just to the pope and the bishops. Uh, it, it, we are not clericalists. We all. We all have been given the faith. We all have an obligation to learn and to know the faith and to defend it and to live it. In, our, in confirmation, we were made soldiers uh, to defend the faith, right? And as you know, and as is quoted by everybody, St. Thomas Aquinas says, a subject can publicly reprove his superior if the faith is in danger, right? Well, Thomas can only say that if he actually thinks that people can know what the faith is independently of what a particular authority might say, right? Again, unless that authority is using, you know, ex cathedra, uh, an, an ex cathedra statement or something. But if the authority says, you know, sorry, no beatific vision for you until the end of time, you know, the the layman can say, no, I'm sorry, that's false, that's wrong, right? Yeah, I, I'm as I said before, I I was Eastern Orthodox, which is really the best alternative out there. But even that it fails uh, against Catholicism in its worst. In its worst crisis yet, uh, I would I'm I thank God I, I'm I'm never never Eastern Orthodox again because ultimately you have to in Eastern Orthodox you you kind of be, have to become your own pope in a sense um, mm -hmm. in some certain questions. Um, it seems to me that many people have a particular conception of the papacy that is beyond Vatican I. As we said in the beginning, we all assent to the dogmas of Vatican I. But people have a conception about the papacy that that is not written in Vatican I, but is it comes from either their own mind or various cons majority theologians or majority opinions here or there. And they then they put their faith, they, they put their divine and Catholic faith not in the dogmas of Vatican I, but they put that in that idea of the papacy. And yes. so they've got their divine and Catholic faith rooted in this opinion, which it could be various levels of certainty, but it's not a dogma. And so then when they find out or when anything threatens it, like if you're if you realize that, no, these popes are not perfect. So therefore, this divine and Catholic faith that I've placed in this conception of the papacy, I must become a sede or I must become a, a papal apologist to defend every single thing, every jot and tittle of every single pope. Right. Um, so it, that that's what I think we're trying to get at, what you're trying to get out with your book, what we're trying to do at One Peter Five, trying to dismantle some of the conceptions about the papacy that are not dogmas yes and let's let's look at those like like catholic men because we're not i i love what you said about that your whole journey did not it never compromised your faith in the papacy you just were were getting into the realism of the papacy and you were assenting to what is really taught in vatican one and you were realizing that you don't need to assent to other ideas that are not contained in vatican one Yes, yes, and just I mean, to 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 return to something I said earlier, what my what my study showed me as I matured in my faith, is that there are multiple principles within Catholicism, that uh, that are meant to be held together, that are held together by God's design, um, and and that no one of them can be taken in in isolation from the others without without uh, without exaggerating it and without um, actually, in a sense, uh, warping it and twisting it. I wrote, you know, I wrote about this at 1 Peter 5, that article about, about um, Protestants, Orthodox, Magisterialists, and Traditionalists. Uh, and, you know, again, there are terminological issues here, but I was trying to make the point that there are three, print, there are three basic pillars, right? Scripture, tradition, magisterium. They have to work together. They, can, they only work together. Uh, when they're separated from each other, weird things happen. And I try to illustrate what that is in that article. I'm not saying it's a perfect article. I mean, I'm sure that there are better ways of saying certain things, but I'm trying to get at, again, this idea, as I said earlier, that tradition is a principle. 
um, the episcopate as as having apostolic succession and authority from Christ. That is a principle. The universal ordinary magisterium is a principle uh, that, in a way, you can say controls what the Pope is and is not able to do. Um, so, I mean, there, you know, there, so yes, the Pope can make ex cathedra definitions. He can define the Immaculate Conception. He can define the Assumption of Our Lady. He can issue censure after censure after censure of Cornelius Jansen. Of course he can do that. And those are infallible uh, acts. Um, but he's not the only principle in the church from which the faith emanates, you know, and from which truth emanates, right? Um, so that's that's really what I think I've, I've, I've learned is just to have a, a more synthetic and a more complex view, um, but it's not complex in the sense that it's it's like obscure and esoteric. I think it's just complex in the way that any organic thing is complex, right? I mean, you take just to take a, a, an, an analogy, the traditional Roman rite of the mass or of baptism or the divine office, it's very complex, extremely complex. And there are long commentaries written about it, but you can get used to it and fall in love with it and understand it and experience it as as um, something beautiful and something stirring and something uh, elevating and something that helps you to worship God. So you don't have to be a genius to go to Latin mass, you know, even though it takes a genius to understand what's going on there, right? Yeah, I think that's kind of like the personhood of the church because a person is a complex reality yes. that you have to get to know that person. And, you know, you, you can be married to someone and get to know them for the rest of your life. And there's a certain personhood of the mystical body of Christ because it's the body of Christ. And there's an organic unity towards all these different aspects of the papacy and different principles. Uh, your, your book brings out, the and so does Roberto de Mattei, the fact that the rock upon which the church is built is the person of Peter. And secondly, also his confession of faith, which is also the rock. And then Christ himself is really the capital R rock. Yes. He's the rock of the rock. Yes. Um, and also the apostles, which are also parts of the foundation of the church. Um, and so there's these, all these different spe uh, aspects of this organic unity of the mystical body of Christ. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Exactly. Excellent. Um, well, we've got, uh, I wanted to get a few more questions in. Um, M Proxima says, can the individual know the faith without anybody to teach him properly? That's where a lot of people are at this point. If they learn the faith early on, I think, and he meant to say, if they have not learned the faith early on, yeah. If you're not catechized, well, I think that Dr. Cage has brought out Tradivox. The, the beautiful thing is that there has been a lot of things made quite clear by the church and passed down in writing. Mm -hmm. So you don't even need uh, in in many things, not all things, but many yes. basic things that are necessary for salvation to believe in have already been made clear. So I think there is a certain auto catechism that one can have mm -hmm. on a lot of different documents. Yeah, that's right. Um, I mean, I think, you know, there, there's this problem of, uh, there's another article at 1 Peter 5 called, Are Traditionalists Guilty of Private Judgment? Um, and that, of course, is, is, a, is a slur that's, that's thrown at us all the time, you know, that we claim to know better than Pope Francis or Pope John Paul II or whoever, insert name of favorite pope. Um, you know, we claim to know better, and that makes us just like Protestants who pick and choose what they're going to accept, et cetera, et cetera. Well, that whole objection is based on hyperpapalism. That is, it's based on the idea that whatever your favorite pope says or whatever any pope says has to be swallowed, hook, line, and sinker. Um, and we just, we just know from history and from Catholic teaching that that's not true, right? So it's, it's, you're, you're doing a serious disservice to yourself and to other people if you keep spouting that lie it's a very damaging lie. Um, there's a reason why, you know, when Vatican I comes around to, to defining when the Pope is infallible dogmatically, you know, it, it, it goes to every possible length and takes such great pains to spell out all the conditions that have to be in place so that it's, there's no guesswork about it. You know, when, when you read Pius IX's uh, dogmatic definition of the Immaculate Conception in the bull in Ephabilis Deus, you have no doubt whatsoever what he's saying, what he's teaching, what you have to do. Um, and he even, he anathematizes and condemns anybody who doesn't accept it. Uh, and the same thing with the definition of the Assumption by Pius XII in 1950. You know, 
the, these popes were, in a sense, demonstrating what Pastor Terence is talking about as far as dogmatic infall infallibility is concerned. Um, so so what, what's my point? My point is there actually are concrete fixed reference points by which we can know what the Catholic Church teaches, what the Catholic faith is, how to live uh, the Catholic religion. Um, and contrary to what a lot of the Hegelian, Darwinian uh, evolution of doctrine types of people want to sell you nowadays, there is a sense in which popes are bound by all of the popes who have preceded them and all of the councils who have preceded them and the universal ordinary magisterium before them. So a pope can't just say one fine day, you know what, the teaching of Humanae Vitae, that was, that was given because, you know, people didn't understand as much back then about human psychology and sociology and because they didn't realize the impact of human beings on global warming and you know, yada, yada, yada. And therefore, we're now going to say that in some circumstances, contraception is permissible, right? If, if a pope ever said that, it would be dead in the water, right? And you could know that. It's not difficult to know that, right? Because the popes cannot expressly contradict the unanimous teaching of the church prior to their times. Um, this is why I reject Pope Francis on the death penalty. This is why I reject Amoris Laetitia chapter eight. I have to, in good conscience, in my faith, by my faith, I have to reject these things, right? He's, he has no authority to teach what he teaches on those subjects. He has undermined his own authority by teaching what he teaches on those subjects in that respect, right? That is, he hasn't made himself cease to be Pope. That is not a judgment that I can arrive at, but he has taught error, uh, and, and he has, but he has not bound me to hold that error, right? So anyway, there's a lot that we can say about this. I just think that, that Timothy is correct to say, read a good old catechism, like the Catechism of the Council of Trent. It's fantastic. You know, it's not perfect. No catechism has absolutely everything in it that you could ever wonder about. That's what I mean by saying it's not perfect. You know, that, that, that no one book can give you everything you're ever looking for. But it's, a, it's, it's the best catechism that the church has ever produced. Um, and in, in many ways, it, it has a lot of strengths that the catechism of John Paul II doesn't have. Um, so, and we know, you know, this is something that was solemnly approved uh, after the Council of Trent to codify the teaching of that most dogmatic of councils and to present it, to present the traditional faith of the church. That's what the Catechism of Trent is doing. That's what the Missal of Pius V is also doing, is transmitting the faith of the church in a reliable um, way that's consistent with the whole of the preceding uh, history of the church and teaching of the church, right? So this is why if we attend the traditional Latin mass and we read the Catechism of the Council of Trent and we entrust ourselves to, to solid authorities like that, um, and for the more daring, the more speculative, reading St. Thomas Aquinas, for example, which all the popes recommend, um, this is how we, we, we gain our bearings, how we orient ourselves with regard to what Catholicism is, not by reading the pope's latest you know, interview with a radio station or on an airplane or something, right? Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think that you do a great job in your book making a distinction between, uh, you know, questioning the Pope on X, Y, Z, and then making a definitive judgment on the Pope, which can be done by ecclesiastical authority. We're both laymen here. We're trying to help the church as much as we can, but we're not trying to make the definitive judgment, which can only be done by the, the, ch the church authority ultimately. Mm -hmm. But I think that in this question, we can note that the majority of the history of the church, the ordinary catechist of every single Catholic is your parents. Yes. Uh, you're baptized, you're given godparents, and you have parents, and the parents are expected to catechize their children to the yes. point that they have all the necessary knowledge of the faith for their own salvation so they can go to heaven. Right. So, yeah. So you don't have to be a, a you know a PhD theologian to know the basics of the faith. That's exactly it. And I'm sure you've encountered this, but I've I've encountered so many homeschooling families who have said, you know, we finally learned our faith really well when we had to teach our children, you know, we, we, go. we, got, okay. we, we got all the textbooks and we got, you know, we, and the catechisms and, you know, we, we, we did the Baltimore catechism ourselves for the first time, the parents doing it along with the child, you know, and that's beautiful. What a beautiful witness to the sanctity of the family and the domestic church and the, you know, the, 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 the natural right of parents and the divine, uh, 
according to the natural law and the divine law, the right of parents to educate their children, um, both as regards, you know, life in the world and as regards the faith. I just give you a quick example of clericalism um, here, since we were talking about that earlier. I have a friend who is telling me that um, that he belonged to uh, a parish where he wanted to, the, the priest said, okay, if your children are going to receive First Communion, they have to be enrolled in this religious ed class. And he, and he talked to the priest privately and he said, you know what, my wife and I, we homeschool our children and we've been doing all their catechism, you know, and, and we're, you know, we're educated people and, uh, or I'm, you know, I'm educated. She knows her faith really well. You know, we can, we can do this and we're going to do it. And the priest said, no, 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 you have, they have to be enrolled in the religious ed class. So he, he really, and then, and then the father said, well, no, I mean, you can, you can quiz the children to make sure that they're ready. I mean, that's completely within your remit, but, but actually we're the primary educators of our children. So finally the priest gave in and let the parents, you know, educate the children and then quizzed them. And the, of course the kids who were quizzed knew more than any, any of the other kids practically. Uh, and, you know, and then it was fine. But the, but the point is that there's this, there's this subtle clericalism that can invade. And this, this is a traditional situation, right? Not a, not a Novus Ordo situation. Um, you know, there's a way in which clericalism can really creep in um, and, you know, and the Pope Francis is constantly condemning clericalism, but he's the worst offender of all of them in this regard, you know? So I think we, we have to, we have to be really careful not to, to fall into the trap of thinking that we are just passive sponges as lay people. Um, and we're everything that we're ever going to receive from the church, we're just going to be passive sponges and it's going to be given to us. We're going to be spoon fed. Um, that's actually partly how the faith has been destroyed in the decades after the second vatican council because the the ones who were who should have taught the faith and passed it on were not doing it and i mean their clergy religious and laity were not passing on the faith so. yes excellent well thank you dr k so much once again road from hyper papalism to catholicism available at the link below stay tuned for more uh, at the podcast on this topic with dr k tomorrow you can go to onepeter5.com. Dr. K has an article for tomorrow on this subject. This has come up a few times, which is the contraception uh, mm -hmm. controversy that has arisen once again. Um, so let us let's offer all these thoughts to Our Lady, and let's pray a hail Mary to to end this. Uh, always that that Our Lady would cleanse us of our impurities, our our pride that we can offer up our faith to God Almighty as a pure sacrifice of worship. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Our Lady of Fatima. Pray for us. Blessed Emperor Carl. Pray for us. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. 